Hello Internet, Seth Skorakowski, and welcome to part 8 of our giant review slash overview for 7th edition Call of Cthulhu. Today we're going to be discussing rules regarding magic and the mythos. These are two separate subjects, but really they're so interlaced that they're just two parts of the same thing. These can cause a lot of confusion with new players and game masters, not because they're difficult, I think, but because the rules are spread out between multiple chapters, which leads one to assume that they're separate things, and it's also a bit confusing, I believe, because a lot of people think that the magic system is going to be something like D&D or video games or other popular role-playing games. Now, one thing that I do want to make crystal clear up front is that I'm not going to be going into the lore and the mythology. I won't be going into Cthulhu or Nihilathotep or the King in Yellow or any of that stuff. This is strictly over the game rules regarding the mythos and magic. First, let's begin with the mythos, or mythos as I sometimes call it by accident. This is represented on our character sheet in the form of the Cthulhu mythos skill. Now, we have touched on this skill a little bit. It's one of the only two skills that don't get an improvement check when used successfully. We've also covered how it affects maximum sanity and how it goes up when your character is driven insane by mythos encounters. That's all in the sanity episodes. So there's no need to repeat any of that here. But we never actually discussed what the Cthulhu mythos is. Essentially, the Cthulhu mythos is a character's understanding of forbidden knowledge, true history, alien science, and magic. With it, a character can identify mythos beings, artifacts, spells, or anything else that's related to the mythos. In addition to sanity-crushing encounters with the mythos, the primary way that a character raises their skill is through reading mythos tomes. These tomes might come in the form of books, scrolls, tablets. They might just be collections of papers and artifacts, such as Dr. Angel's box and the Call of Cthulhu short story. They can take a lot of forms. In modern stories, you might make a mythos tome something like a Super 8 tape or a DVD or something like that. Some, it's a modern form of technology. The Keeper's Guide does have a good list of various mythos tomes to either use or to give you ideas on how to make your own for your game. Mythos tomes might seem unassumingly simple, or they might carry a sinister aura. Keeper should describe this book. What does it look like? Does it smell like mold and old leather, or does it smell like cinnamon and flowers? Does it smell different to each character? Is that something about it that's weird? Maybe the bookmark in the book moves when nobody's looking, or maybe the book occasionally just moves around the player's house here when they're not looking, and periodically they look down and they go, did I leave that there? Did somebody come into my place and move that? So the tomes can have some sort of magical effect if the keeper desires for them to. Now these tomes are rarely laid out in a nice logical clean order. They're written by madmen, half-literate zealots, or just assemblies of random information that somebody put together. The knowledge inside those books also might be obscured by being presented as unrelated things. A childish story in the Book of Eben about a curious hummingbird might really be a strange explanation about how the Migo travel through space to steal people's brains. It could take a reader a couple times reading this book over the course of years to discover all the knowledge hidden with inside of it. There are several steps in reading a mythos tome, but first let's go over some of the terminology. Uh, so returning to this list of tomes, and I don't expect you all to understand this up front, but we got to start somewhere. Language is the language that the tome is written in. Weeks is how many weeks a full reading and study is going to take. San is the potential sanity loss each reading of the tome will do. CMI stands for Cthulhu Mythos Initial. That's the number of Mythos skill rating points that are earned from an initial reading of the book. CMF stands for Cthulhu Mythos Full. That's the number of Cthulhu Mythos points earned after a full reading and study of the tome. MR stands for the tome's Cthulhu Mythos Rating. This is the maximum number of potential Mythos points that it can give through repeated readings and also the Mythos score if the book is to be used as reference. So now let's explain what all that means. So the first step in reading a Mythos tome, the Keeper must determine the language and the difficulty in reading that tome. Not only must a reader be able to read the specific language, but factors such as age and if it's damaged or if it's handwritten or written in some sort of archaic dialect really does increase the difficulty. Just because you can read English doesn't necessarily mean you can written, read a book that was written in the 14th century English and handwritten and has had some water damage. Next, we begin what's called the initial reading. The initial reading is more of a casual reading rather than a full study. It can take hours or it can take days, depending on what the keeper decides. 
One simple way that keepers might decide is that the time of an initial reading is as many hours as a full reading takes weeks. So, for example, if a book says it's going to take 10 weeks for a full reading, it can just be read in 10 hours. Next, the player just rolls their language roll at the appropriate difficulty. If they succeed, that means they can successfully read the book and have successfully made an initial reading. Their sanity is automatically reduced by the sanity value of the tome. There is no save against this. They just lose it depending on how much is lost. It could also determine if they suffer from indefinite insanity or temporary insanity. Now, if insanity does occur from doing a reading, keepers might want to change the character's most cherished item to being that of the Mythos Tome, or they might incorporate some of the tome's contents into the insanity, such as different phobias or delusions that the insane character has. Next, the character's Cthulhu Mythos skill is raised by the CMI value of the tome. Remember to reduce the maximum sanity as their Mythos skill increases. Now for a full reading. Unlike the initial read-through, this is a comprehensive study of the tome, meaning that your character might be making notes, conferring with maps and other books, rereading passages over and over again, and performing a slow, methodical study of the tome's contents to unlock its hidden wisdom. The full reading works just a little bit different. Since the character has already completed an initial reading of the book, they've already made their language roll, they don't need to roll a second language roll, they have already done that. They've already proven they can read it, no need to try to punish them by having them suddenly not be able to read it. Once they've spent the appropriate amount of time to do a full reading of that specific book, the players get to make a sanity roll to see if they lose sanity for the full reading. So just to be clear, on the first reading, on the initial reading, sanity loss is automatic. On subsequent readings after that, sanity loss does get a save. The character's Cthulhu Mythos skill is then raised by the tome's CMF value. However, the new Cthulhu Mythos skill cannot go above the book's own Mythos rating. Once the character has completed the full reading, they can then read it again, possibly gaining more knowledge. Further readings of the tome work the exact same way as a full reading does regarding the sanity save and raising the character's Cthulhu Mythos. However, every reading after the first reading takes twice as long to, to read it as it did before. In addition to full readings, a character might just simply use the tome as a reference. If the characters all encounter some sort of mythos entity and they want to learn how to identify or learn how to stop it, but none of them make their Cthulhu Mythos skill, they can simply check the book to see if there's information in there. Checking a tome for specific information takes one die four hours. Once that time is complete, the player then rolls against the tome's Mythos rating to see if they found any relevant information inside the book. So, for example, let's say our character Jack discovers a book of Zion. The tome is in English, but is battered and handwritten, so the keeper determines that this is going to require a hard language check. Jack's English language skill is 60, so he's going to need to roll a 30 or under in order to read the book. He succeeds and can read it. A full reading is going to take 14 weeks, but the keeper determines that an initial reading is only going to take 7 hours. After 7 hours of perusal, Jack automatically loses 1 die 6 sanity, and his Cthulhu Mythos skill goes up by 3 points. Now that the initial reading is done, Jack decides to give it a full reading. He pours over the tome for 14 weeks, and at the end of that, he makes a sanity roll to see if he loses 1 die 6 sanity or not. His Cthulhu Mythos skill is 8, which is well below the book's Mythos rating of 27. So Jack increases his Cthulhu Mythos score by 6 points, bringing that up to 14. Now, if Jack decides to study the book again, the time for that increases from 14 weeks to 28. After that time, he rolls his sanity for possible loss and increases his mythos by six more points. A third full reading of study is going to take Jack 56 weeks to complete, over a full year, but that's going to bring his Cthulhu mythos skill up to 26. Now, if Jack decides to read this book for a fourth time for whatever reason, the task is going to take him 112 weeks, but he's only going to gain one additional point of Cthulhu mythos. That's because the 27 maximum rating for the particular tome. Obviously, studying these tomes is going to take an incredible amount of time for the characters to do, and this is all assumed to take place between adventures. So what I do for these is at the start of each session, we go over what had occurred between the different adventures with the characters, and that's a period that could be a few weeks, or it could be a few months, it could even be a year. The players might say that they spent half their time reading the Mythos Dome and half their time doing other stuff. Then we simply deduct how many weeks that is from the amount of time the character needs to read the book. 
So, for example, if we said it was two months between adventures, and the character says that they spent half their time reading the Mythos Tome, then we just deduct one month or four weeks from the total amount of time that they need in order to finish that reading. Now, one exception to sanity loss is belief. Sanity loss for reading tomes only happens if the character believes that the information inside is true. If the character reads it from more of an academic standpoint, believing it's simply you know, just a simple mythology or mad men's ravings, then their mythos skill will increase, but their sanity is going to remain unchanged. However, at any point they can decide that they want to become believers. And if a character becomes a believer, then whatever their full amount of their Cthulhu Mythos skill at that time is, is then deducted from their sanity all at once. So in the case of our character here, that's 27 points. That's enough to drive them indefinitely insane. The other method from converting a non-believer into a believer is if that character loses sanity from a Mythos encounter. For example, let's say Jack here meets a ghoul. If he makes a sanity save, he's completely fine. Whoa, that thing is weird. That's like some sort of freak of evolution, ain't it? You know, I bet that is the source of those ghoul myths that I've been reading about in that crazy book. However, if that sanity roll fails and Jack loses just a single point of sand from that encounter, then that is enough to convert him from a non-believer into a full believer. Holy crap! That is a freaking ghoul! And if ghouls are real, that means everything else that I read about is real! Oh my god! It's all true! Obviously such an encounter is going to turn what should have normally been a minor loss of sanity into a full mind-crushing revelation. Now there are a few other rules on tomes I'm going to go over. Only one tome can be studied at a time. Also, tomes might improve other skills, such as history, other languages, including mythos languages, cult, various sciences like biology, physics, astronomy, any of that. For those, a keeper can just simply give a basic skill improvement check under the appropriate skills, or they could just give them a direct reward for, you know, a d6 or a d10 for those skill points and those skills, but I'd recommend you only do that on the initial reading or the first full reading. Don't give that to them every single time they read it. Also, Mythos Tomes might include directions on how to cast spells, which brings us to the second part of this episode, magic. Well, it is about time. I, for one, have been looking forward to casting fireballs and magic missiles and healing. Oh my god, healing spells? I can't wait. Sorry to disappoint you, but you're not going to find any of those. Wait, what? No, you said this is supposed to be magic. Oh, it is, and we get a lot of great spells, just don't expect this to be like D&D. For one, healing spells are almost non-existent in the game. There are no healing spells in the core book. We can find a couple of them in the Grand Grimoire of Cthulhu Mythos Magic book. I plan to discuss that book eventually, but as far as the core game, there is no healing spells. Now, the first step in casting a Cthulhu Mythos spell is belief. If you don't believe in the Mythos, you can't cast Mythos Magic. There are three ways to learn Mythos spells. The first is reading it from a tome. This process takes two dice six weeks and a hard intelligence roll. Now, if that roll fails, it can be pushed, but at the risk of consequences for failure. Otherwise, the character is going to need to start over and relearn it from the tome. The second way is from a person, a teacher, a PC, or an NPC. This process is much easier and only takes one die eight days and a hard intelligence roll. Personally, I think there should be a bonus die to that because there's a teacher to help assist that character, but that's just my house rule. The third way is from a Mythos entity. This can either be a psychic imprint all at once or over the course of many nights coming to them in their dreams. The time it takes is completely up to the Keeper. However, having a spell psychically implanted in your brain like that should probably cost some sanity. The rulebook recommends that it be about 1 to 6 as the sanity cost for that. This is then followed by a regular intelligence roll to see if the character can now wrap their head around this new spell that's on the inside their brain. A character's first attempt to cast a spell requires a hard pow roll. If that roll fails, it may be pushed, but failure on the pushed roll does mean the spell works, but comes with some sort of dire consequences, such as increased sanity loss, hitting the caster, unforeseen effects, Drawing the attention of a Mythos deity or whatever the Keeper desires, feel free to be devious with this. Now, a player can avoid that if they then go back and relearn the spell from scratch instead of trying to push the roll. Once the character does cast the spell, they never need to do a casting roll for it ever again. However, bending the universe and the wills of others does come at a price. All magic has a price. The first is for magic points. 
Magic points are determined during character creation, and they're here you can find them on the sheet. If a character doesn't have sufficient magic points for a casting, then their acquired points are then deducted from their hit points on a one-for-one -one basis. Magic points recover at one point an hour. Hit points that are lost through magic are going to be recovered at normal healing rate, which is pretty slow. Other costs for spell casting include sanity points. Now these sanity points are going to be lost every single time you cast, and they can easily cause insanity. Sometimes POW is reduced for very powerful spells, and unlike magic points, POW doesn't come back. It doesn't regenerate, it's just gone forever. Well, not forever, we'll get to that in a second. For example, Wither Limb costs 8 magic points and 1 die 6 sanity points every time it is cast. Casting an Elder Sun costs no magic points or sanity, but costs 10 POW, which also then reduces the character's maximum magic points if their POW goes down. Now, spells that do take rounds to cast, such as Enthrall Victim, will take effect on the character's normal action order in a combat round. However, spells with a casting time of instantaneous are so fast that they let the caster add 50 to their action order, just the same as a character does with a readied firearm. Now, one thing that you notice with each spell is they have alternate names listed at the very bottom. Not all entities or tomes are going to call a spell by the same name. So the character might discover a spell, the Song of Pain, and never realize that it's the same spell as Wither Limb. To me, I find this pretty neat. It keeps a bit of mystery to the spells in the Call of Cthulhu game. It limits out-of-character knowledge. That way, if the players know what the spells are, then the characters aren't supposed to. The players aren't going to recognize the spell because you're going to be calling it by a different name, and it's going to have a cool air of mystery. The only problem with this is that the Keeper does need to do all the paperwork to keep track of what name they gave the players. That way, if they need to look up what that spell is, they remember what name the spell is listed under inside the book. Keepers may also add requirements to spells, material components, drawing a circle, performing them only under certain astrological conditions, whatever they want. Now, speaking of altering spells, there is deeper magic. Some spells have a deeper version listed with them, describing a more powerful variant. However, all spells are supposed to have deeper versions, they just didn't list them all for you. Most cultists, NPC sorcerers, and mythos entities already have the deeper version. The PCs, for them to unlock the deeper magic, requires first that they be insane, either indefinite or temporary. If they cast a spell while insane, they then get to make a Cthulhu Mythos roll. If they roll under their Mythos uh, level, then they have opened their mind to the deeper version of the spell and can now have the more powerful variant of it even after their sanity does return. Opposed POW rolls. Some spells, like Dominate, pit the caster's POW against the target's POW stat, essentially in opposition of wills. If the caster and their target tie in a POW check, such as they both get an extreme success, then the winner of that conflict becomes the character that's got the highest POW. Now, if there is a tie, they both have the same POW, they both got the same level of success, then the spell does go off, however some sort of other thing happens, like they're both affected by it, or some other result that's determined by the Keeper. Now, since POW is so important to magic, let's talk about raising POW up. There are two ways that it can be done. First, if the character makes a luck roll and scores an OT1, a critical success, then the player can make an improvement check on their POW. They roll percentage dice, and if the result is higher than their current POW, then they get to roll a d10 and raise their POW by whatever that number is. Second, if a character casts a spell requiring an opposed POW roll, and they successfully win, then they get to make a POW improvement check for that. Now, in my game, I say that the caster must have a clear success, meaning that on that opposed POW roll, they did score at least one level of success higher than the targets. Spontaneous Mythos Spells Sometimes desperate times call for desperate measures, and a character might find themselves needing a spell that they don't know. Using their knowledge of the Cthulhu Mythos, a character can summon magic to their will to aid them, it can be any spell or any effect, even one that there's no known spell for. The player simply states the desired effect that they want. The keeper then determines if that's even going to be possible and might be able to suggest some sort of, you know, lesser things as an alternative. They then set the difficulty that the character is going to need to roll to get the desired result. The character rolls the Cthulhu Mythos check, and if they succeed at whatever level the keeper decided, then the spell goes off. The Keeper should also decide whatever the appropriate cost for sanity and magic points and all that. Possibly want to confer with any sort of spells that are already existing in the books that are like that. 
If the spell is normally something that has an opposed POW role, then the caster uses their Cthulhu Mythos instead of their own POW when they do this opposed role. So it's the caster's Cthulhu Mythos versus the target's POW. Usually the target's going to have a higher POW for those sort of things. The book does give a few examples of possible spontaneous Cthulhu Mythos spells, which is very nice. Now one thing to note is even if the casting is successful, the character doesn't learn the spell. They're not going to be able to cast it easily after that. Every single time they want to use a spontaneous Cthulhu spell, they have to roll their mythos regardless if they've gotten it to work before or not. So it's not as clean as if the player actually goes through all the process of learning a spell, but it is a rather nice option to have if the chips are down. Okay. That's going to be it for this episode, and hopefully I've answered some questions and helped you out with understanding the rules and not confused anybody that too much. The next episode is going to be the last episode of this normal series. It's going to cover some of the just different house rules and suggestions, add amendments, or anything else that I wasn't able to fit in before now. Of course, if you enjoyed the video, please give it a like or share it with other people. If you want to see some other videos in this series or some of the other videos such as game reviews or RPG philosophy, just hit that subscribe button. And if you want to support me and my channel or if you simply want some kick-ass urban fantasy about monster hunters, you can find links for my novels and my audiobooks below. Till next time, gamers, have a great day. Your fierce, the